All right, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna call our Committee of the Whole meeting to order for Thursday, December 7th. Um, this is the cancellation from the Monday meeting. Um, so welcome everyone to Council Chambers. We have some folks in the gallery this evening, which is wonderful. And welcome, of course, to the folks watching online. Um, we're going to start by checking in if there are any items to add to the agenda. And um, since I've just landed back, I would like to discuss the Marine Renewables Conference. So we'll add that as item number, is it 12.1, I guess? Okay. Um, are there any other additions? Councillor Digden? Um, yeah, Madam Orden, I would list, uh, I guess, just a quick review on uh, a conversation I had with a local resident on a 911 call. So I think maybe just 911 protocol, or I know it doesn't fit within our, maybe just some literature for the public. Thank you, Councillor Digden. So any further additions to the agenda? Okay, so hearing none, could I have a motion to approve, please? I'll make that motion. Thanks, Deputy Warden. Uh, could I have a seconder, please? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councillor Digden. Any further discussion on the agenda? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. Thanks, folks. Uh, so the first item on the agenda is the review of minutes. Uh, so those are from November 6, 2023, Committee of the Whole. They were produced or provided in advance for your review. Are there any errors or omissions to report? And if not, I'll hear a motion, please. I move to accept the minutes. Thank you, Councillor Sampson. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Sampson. Any further discussion on the minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? That motion is carried. Okay, so the next item on our agenda, we're going to move into our presentations. So the first presentation we have up is related to Woodland Angelica, and we have Claire Doyle from the Isle Madame Garden Club here with us this evening. So Claire, I'll ask you to come up to the table, and you can have a seat um, in front of the microphone. Um, <coughs> on the other side there. And when you're getting ready to speak, if you could just press the little red button on your thing and it'll activate your mic, okay? And thank you for being here with us today. And yeah, just if you could introduce yourselves and sure. take it away. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. So my name is Claire Doyle and um, I'm chairperson of the Amadam Garden Club. And to my left is Bridget Sprouls She's a member, also a member of our garden club. And Bridget provided the technical assistance to put together the presentation tonight, and she'll be sharing that with us. So um, we thank you for inviting us to the, to the table this evening. Um, I'd like to begin by saying just a few words about the garden club. Um, we're a registered entity. Uh, and we've we've been registered with joint stocks since 2018, um, and uh, we have presently we have 41 club members, garden club members, and uh, we belong to the Nova Scotia Association of Garden Clubs, and we also uh, belong to a network uh, of garden clubs throughout Cape Breton. Our mandate is to encourage the love of gardening. And I think everybody loves gardening, especially since 2020, uh, since the pandemic, there was an explosion of garden, of people, you know, uh, taking gardens in. So we do, um, uh, well, like we uh, promote uh, gardening through different activities. Um, we offer gardening tips on our Al Madame Garden Club Facebook page. We provide educational tips there. And, and that's open to the members, but it's also open to the community. We host plant sales and we do seed exchanges and uh, we create gardening events, gardening fun events. And we partner with the Rocky Bay Irish Club. We have a community garden there and they 
allow us to use their space and to use the you know t to use their their land and um, and so we have a very good relationship with the Rocky Bay Irish Club. And we also um, are trying to establish a daffodil trail on Alma Dam, and we've been promoting that for the past few years, where we encourage individuals to plant daffodils. It's the first flower that kind of comes out in the spring, and it's colorful, and it brightens us up after a long winter. And um, and we've we've had some a good partnership with the municipality because the municipality has bought some daffodils from us, and. They purchase the daffodils and we plant them, so, so it's a good partnership. <laughs> and um, if you guys notice in the spring, um, through the uh, in Arishat on the main, where you people have beautiful gardens there, the uh, the daffodils like are popping up, and it's really quite lovely to see them. You know, at the beginning of June, they last for three weeks, and it's kind of the beginning of the gardening season. So, yeah. Our presentation this evening is on in, uh, that invasive weed called woodland angelica. Um, and it's found abundantly throughout Richmond County. Everywhere. Everywhere. But particularly, we think, on Alma Dam, because um, Alma Dam is, uh, is seeing an infestation of it. And I don't know, I, I think maybe it's because we're near the waterway, you know, probably, I'm not sure. But it is everywhere, so that's for sure. And so you'll find them in the ditches, and you'll find them in open fields and private woodlands, in, on, even in, on the beach now that you're seeing them on the beach. They're everywhere. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, um, I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask Bridget to go through the presentation, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, thanks for having us. Um, we're here to talk about woodland angelic, and I'm sure most of you are able to recognize it when you see it, have even battled some of it. Um, but it poses a threat to the kind of um, the natural rhythm of other plants um, by outcompeting for sunlight, space, and even pollinators. So we'll talk a bit about how that works. Um, a bit about the plant and then what you can do and some suggestions that we have. See how I, okay. Um, so it was first introduced here in the 1600s or 1700s um, and has since spread to other provinces, but as Claire has said, it's, we're kind of ground zero um, in Cape Breton for Angelica sylvestris. Um, there are a few varieties of Angelica, but this is the variety that um, we seem to be inundated with. And it's a large biennial meaning that the first year it grows, um, we see the, the, the plant is relatively small and doesn't flower until the second season or the second year, um, and then it dies and it's finished. So it takes two years for it to flower and to create more seeds. Um, when it flowers, that is when it's the tallest and it can reach up to two meters tall, two meters high, so large, tall stands. Um, and it flowers late in the summer and into September. Um, and, you know, we know what it looks like, but it has white to pale lilac flowers in small kind of packages of umbrels, sort of shaped like an umbrella as a whole. And it grows anywhere, really. It's not particular. It likes um, dry land. Or it likes swampy land. It, you know, it pre has preferences, but really it's drought resistant. And the seeds float, which is why you see it in drains, because um, they, that's how they travel you know, with rainwater. Um, otherwise, they just kind of fall down, and that's where they can grow the following year. But um, it travels easily on water, and then it also is, you know, tolerant of shade, drought, all these things. So it's a real survivor. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like I said, it competes for sunlight with other native plants. Um, and it seems to be delicious to the pollinators um, because it sort of distracts them from other wildflowers and berries um, and other plants that you'd want, um, you, you know, the bees to be pollinating. So it kind of, you'll see, if you see an angelica, it's almost guaranteed to have some sort of 
insect on it um, because, and you can smell it, it smells delicious like a great popsicle. Um, but it, so it distracts pollinators from, from other, uh, from other things that we want them to be pollinating, which decreases the, um, the, the density of other plants in an area because it doesn't allow them to um, proliferate. So that's Angelica replacing the berries there. <laughs> okay. Um, how to stop it? Um, as you might imagine, mowing works. Uh, you'd have to do it uh, at least twice a growing season and before it goes to seed, right? Um, so while it's flowering at the beginning of the flowering period or even before that. But, um, but if you take out some of the, the flowers of the second year plant, it'll just grow new flowers. So you really have to kind of come at it multiple times. It's like a, uh, it just keeps coming back. Um, weed whack in, in your drains. Um, you can dig the plant out or if it's rained a lot, you can pull it right out. My friend's mother just does that. Um, and then also if you're really uh, buried in Angelica like we've been um, uh, and like through the forest and things you can cut the flowers um, during during their flowering period or when you see them just starting to form with clippers or secateurs or machete and clippers that work the best I find um, and also it's not toxic to to livestock so if you do have animals you can graze them on it and that would work too Want to add anything? Well, no, other than uh, one, one plant, one flower itself can produce up to 10,000 seeds. And you know, it gets carried by the wind, the birds uh, carry it, and uh, I think that's probably why. And we've had a lot of people come to our table to talk about um, the blueberries and the cranberries and the wild, the wild berries that, that, that is now, it's, it's affecting them because um, these, the, our berries are kind of low to the ground, and then you've got these weeds or, you know, the angelica that grows way tall, and it's um, it, it just, it, they, they're not getting the sun, they're not getting pollinated, and it, it is a big problem. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's, it's a big problem here on the island because a lot of people, uh, they, um, they go in the woods and they, they do collect all of the, of the berries that are out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, they're seeing quite a decline of them mm -hmm. on the island itself, and I'm sure it's everywhere else in Richmond County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just a word on um, cutting the angelica flowers off and then also what we can expect as far as results from putting in this effort. Um, it, like I said, you'll, it'll take multiple passes in a season um, so kind of cutting off the flowers, uh, you know, all the flowers that you can see on a certain day isn't going to eradicate the plant. They'll grow new flowers. So you just have to stay on top of it if that's the approach you plan to take. Um, but also because it's a biennial, removing the plants that you see flowering doesn't mean that next year won't have flowering. You won't have flowering angelica, right? Because it takes them two years. So to really see results it'll probably take at least two, three years, um, and then you know, you'll have a, a real reduction. But, so it's important not to be discouraged when you don't see immediate results from the effort. Yeah. Um, and we, were, we attended um, a, a, a presentation on angelica removal by the Nova Scotia Invasive Species um, Council, and they were suggesting using black bags, but as we know here, the dump doesn't accept black bags. We don't want to compost angelica, so what do you do? If you cut the angelica while it's flowering, before it's gone to seed, you know, if you look at it, you see it's it hasn't gone to seed, it's okay to just let the flowers drop. Otherwise, it just takes so much time and space, and you have a bunch of black bags that you don't know what to do with, so don't worry about it. You know, we all know how to kind of make sure the weeds die. Just throw them on some gravel or in a dry spot in the sun. Um, okay, and is angelica dangerous? Uh, we've kind of heard people saying that it poses risk to asthmatics, that it'll burn your skin, um, but for most 
I don't know about asthmatic. If, if people are sensitive to, be, to any kind of pollen, then obviously you'd want to wear a mask if you're trying to get rid of your angelica. Um, but otherwise, it's not a toxic plant. It's just recommended that the public take precautions when removing it because it looks like other toxic plants. So, but if you're good at identifying angelica, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, if you are nervous or unsure, however, you can wear gloves. It's not a big deal. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And here's some suggestions that we had um, to raise awareness. That's kind of number one, uh, just for more people to know about it, to know it's, you know, it, may, it may be kind of quaint looking, but it's not good for our local ecosystem, and it doesn't help other plants that we value to thrive. So just awareness, maybe an article in Richmond Reflections, um, or even a, a page on um, a website, the municipality's website, about local invasive plants that um, you can look out for, something like that. Um, Claire was thinking about events in the community to help reduce Angelica. Yeah, we were, you know, because sometimes you, um, you see groups of people that says adopt a highway or people kind of go out and do cleaning in their, you know, on the highways and in the drains. And uh, I was, we were just kind of thinking maybe, you know, we could designate like a day where um, people could kind of go out before, before the uh, Angelica goes to seed. That's the secret. Once it goes to seed, then it's a big problem. You know, then you need to bag them and you need to take them someplace that it's safe. And we don't have a designated place at the, at the dump, uh, at the landfill where, you know, but maybe we could work with, in partnership with you guys to designate a spot, you know, where people could actually, instead of um, just kind of taking them to the dump, is just to have a designated place to, to place it there, you know, where it could be buried or something, you know. So it's just some ideas, just some ideas. I know that um, I, I kind of took a look at the, uh, the Weed Control Act, the Provincial Weed Control Act, of, and it was, um, it was revised in 1989, but it, it doesn't designate Angelica as a noxious weed. So, um, but, uh, if we, if it's an infestation and it's really starting to damage our ecosystem and all of our natural plants, it maybe the municipality could have a second look at that and work with the provincial government. It hasn't been revised for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, we don't have a weed control inspector here uh, in the county here. So there might be some ideas, you know, where we could look at it and see, and public education. You know, I, I know that a lot of people in this area have beautiful lawns, well <laughs> manicured, and, but then you have all of the angelica in front of the drains, and it, it really is quite pretty. And I, but <laughs> it's to kind of provide that, um, that education to the public that maybe they should be cutting it down, you know wherever they see it on their properties. Um, we thought about creating an internship just uh, to help spread awareness if the young people were um, encouraged to get involved somehow, at least to educate their communities about Angelica, um, creating some sort of summer internship. And, and then there's the idea of um, renting sheep <laughs> uh, with temporary fencing, some electric fencing, moving them around that way. But and it really works. It really yeah. works. Yeah. 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 And that's that's about it. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you, folks. Um, does anybody have questions for our comments for um, is Bridget was it and and uh, Claire? Um, I will tell you, I've been. I've been bagging that stuff because I thought that that was the only way to get rid of it. I'm digging it out. I'm, I've become a little obsessive about it. Um, but then I'm, I'm always like, what do you, what do you do with the bag? <laughs> what do you do with this? So I'm, then I'm like, taking this like toxic waste. I feel like I'm handling. Now I know better. I'm trying to burn it or I'm like, you know, whatever. So that's really great information. I'm wondering if maybe we could pop some information on our website or, you know, if we could use some of your images even, you know, um, or maybe there's the presentation and, set it up like a little slideshow on... I mean, uh, just the, the idea that um, 
I didn't know myself uh, either that the difference between... Oh, can you press your button, Claire? The, wood, the angelica flowering, and then the angelica, once it goes to seed, it's it. those are really two important parts, like, you know, to cut it down before it actually goes to seed. And uh, so there's like a time period towards the end of August, around the month of September, when, you know, the flower kind of dies down. And then it's like what Bridget said, if you cut it while it's in flower, you really don't need to worry because it's not going to regrow. It's when it goes to seed, it spreads, that's when it regrows. So um, that's the idea of kind of getting that education out there to the public. Oh, sorry, you'll need to put your button back. I don't think anyone should feel ashamed by to have Angelica in their yard because we've been battling it and we still have some. Yeah. Right? I don't want anyone to think my property is Angelica free. It's not. <laughs> so. Sorry. Can it can it be sprayed? I am sure there's going to be a question that many homeowners, instead of pulling it out or cutting it with clippers, can can it be sprayed with a Nova Scotia Council the, of Invasive Species that, you know, that we had that meeting in June, uh, they didn't really have, um, there was no spray out there to um, actually kill it without using, like, harsh chemicals, like, you know, so natural, chem uh, natural sprays, I don't think will cut yeah. it. I'm sure, um, you know, Roundup and other things would work, but I don't know that that's advisable. Yeah. Um, it's you know, that's not a very green option. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Claire. And, and Bridget, I, I think you might be right about the ocean side uh, influence, too, because I the other place I notice it is a lot of it in Lordways, like what I would consider in some places an infestation. And that, again, is very open to the ocean there, right? So anyway, very interesting. So maybe we'll take some of your information and, and put it out as educational material if, if you're okay with that, and we'll get the ball rolling. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, so the next item on our agenda is affordable housing projects. So Rochelle Sampson is with us from SRD International. And Rochelle, I'll ask you to come on up if you don't mind. And when you're settled in there, you'll just uh, press the red button to activate your mic. So over to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Rochelle Sampson. Um, I'm here on behalf of SRD International, who is a local developer. Um, some of you may know me, some of you haven't. Um, back in November of 2020, so it's been about three years now, I recently I had talked about uh, an affordable housing development on Grandic Road. So I'm here to circle back and give you guys an update and chat with you guys about that today. So where we left off was I had done a presentation. We had determined that the zoning was incorrect at the time, that you could not build multi-units on one piece of property. So SRD was instructed to go work with EDPC to amend the bylaw and uh, figure that out. So the conclusion there was that we, we did that. It took us a year, which was uh, you know a bit of a shock, but it got done. And so now we have to apply for a development agreement, which is fine, but it also comes with its own set of checklists that you have to complete, um, things that might cost money and things that you have to, to do. So that, that takes some time as well. Uh, Chris Boudreau, the engineer of the county, had done a, a presentation to council on the cost to extend water and sewer to the property. So he had provided, I think, three different options. One was to just do it to the two first properties that we're looking at developing. Another option was to run it the rest of the way down the property. Um, and there, I think there was a third. I know there was three cost points, um, but I can circle back to that once I pull up that email. Um, so to my knowledge, it was supposed to go maybe to like a bylaw meeting uh, to be discussed because it was a project over a certain amount of money. So in order for the county to um, consider providing assistance to us, they had to bring it to the meeting for further discussion. And from what I know, that didn't, that didn't go anywhere. So it just didn't happen. So to give you an update, we have increased the amount of units that we're looking to provide. We're looking to build two units at 12 units each side by side, which is a total of 24 affordable housing units for the county. Um, 
as you know, the costs have increased since 2020, so we're, we're in a bit of a different ball game right now. Uh, but the affordable housing crisis has continued and is definitely prominent in our small town. So it's, it's definitely still needed. Our new timeline is the spring. So we're looking to break down, break ground in uh, spring of 2024. We have an affordable housing application going in probably within the next week or so, and as well as CMHC. So that covers uh, the provincial and the federal uh, contributions. Uh, so to explain affordable housing a little bit to uh, community members and, and to council, um, affordable housing is different than regular housing. Affordable housing, you are capped at how much you can charge for rent. So to keep it affordable for the people who are going to live there, you can't just charge whatever you'd like. You have guidelines and you have boundaries that you have to stay within uh, to ensure that it's affordable. And that's really the market that we're trying to reach. We are not looking at making... Um, uh, above affordable housing. We're looking to help the low income earners, the seniors who are on a pension, um, you know, and the people who work seasonally, the, the, just people who, who, you know, are trying to just not spend their whole paycheck on, on rent at this point. So in order to keep rents low, we need to keep our construction costs low. So that's kind of the bounce back between the two. So we can't offer affordable rents if it cost us an excessive amount of money to build these units. So the project is currently valued at $6 million. We as a developer are required to put in 20% right off the cuff as equity. So you're looking at about 1.2. So um, affordable housing also is not a super lucrative investment. You're looking at about a 30 year return. And at that, you're still, it's, it's not big money coming in. It's still affordable rents that are coming in even once you've paid off your building. So it's a different game altogether than just regular rental uh, renting. So it's really imperative for all levels of, of government to chip in to ensure that the cost of this building and this development is affordable. Um, so in conclusion, we need to finalize a plan to extend water and sewer to this property because we have yet to, to do that. So we are looking for a definitive answer from the council, from the county, if you guys are interested in partnering with us on this project, as we have provincial government, we have the federal government um, in play already. So there's a couple of options on how you can jump in and um, I can pitch them to you guys and you guys can let me know what you also have available to you. So the development of building our own water and sewer system is at 150,000 to 200,000 to build our own and we're about 175 meters from the main. So uh, from what I understand there's a capital growth fund um, that the council has access to apply for and so one option is that uh, you could apply to you, uh, the county, the council could apply to extend the water and sewer themselves. It would be their project to extend the sewer. It would service these lots. And these lots are designated to affordable housing. Uh, the county could apply to that same fund to help an affordable housing developer with the cost of installing their own water and sewer system. Uh, we could look at helping to maintain or service the system. We could, once, you know, if we're going to put our own system in there, you could consider not charging us for the hookup to the main. Um, we chatted with other municipalities who have recently completed some housing development projects with local developers, and they've uh, granted back some of the funds um, that it was cost, and it was, I think, in relation to I think the tax portion, they gave them back the money, the construction tax portion of the, the expense, um, and they covered their cost of permits during the construction phase as well. So uh, in conclusion, I mean, it's been three years since we had brought this project to your guys' attention. Um, you know, in those three years, we've still been fighting to kind of move it along. It is a little bit frustrating, the amount of hoops that we've had to jump through to try to bridge a gap of affordable housing uh, in the community. Um, it's cost us time, it's cost us funds, we've had to develop plans, we've had to get permits, we've had to you know, do quite a few things. So we've been really pushing forward. Um, so we're, we're really looking to understand you know, if the county is interested in being a partner on this project and we're looking to determine this um, you know, within a very short timeline as we're looking to break ground in the spring. Um, but without the county, it's going to be really hard to keep this project affordable, which you know could then deter us from being able to complete this project at all. So that's kind of my, my spiel. 
<laughs> okay, thanks, Rochelle. So does anybody have any questions for Rochelle? Or comments, whichever? Yeah, so for, for me, Rochelle, thanks very much for coming in and thanks for uh, keeping on pushing this situation. Like you say, it's been a long road for you guys. And, and you know, when I look at the Housing Nova Scotia report that just came out and, and you look at a gap of 370 units, uh, you guys are talking 24 units. And I think you had mentioned there are seven mm -hmm. in the future. For me, 31 units is 8% of that 370 gap. That's a huge number, in my opinion, right? So for us, I think we got to jump on this train, right? I mean, uh, this this problem ain't going anywhere. So I mean, you look, and I think the number is 515 units, you know, before 2027. So this number is just getting worse. Uh, so for me, uh, you know, I would like to see uh, us look into uh, CEO, I know that we had looked into uh, the sidewalk project here at, uh, at Calbopor, and we had, <coughs> had worked with our director of public works to see if that capital growth fund uh, was eligible, and if we, if we could get a piece of that $32 million pie. I would like to request that same approach with this project to see if, you know, that project and running that water and sewer for this project would fit uh, in the capital growth fund, right, to see if, again, we can source some of that $32 million pie to see if we can help our S help out uh, SRD International with this project, because I think we got to move these projects forward and uh, we, we got to hop on the train ASAP, in my opinion, right? Okay, thanks, Deputy Warden. And I, yeah, I really do appreciate the urgency of the issue. It's certainly something the Housing Coalition has got on its radar, front and center. And I agree with you, the pace of government is frustratingly slow. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, I, I, you know, I can agree with you on that for sure. Um, I think, you know, having chatted with staff about this, one of the things that we need to look into in order to kind of move anything forward is to understand whether or not the water and sewer system here can handle the capacity of the kind of development you're talking about. So we know that, so we're looking to, re, you know, eventually replace the system that we have here. It's it's a multi, multi-million dollar project. I'm thinking, is it in the 20 million? Is 15. 15 million dollar range because uh, right now it's not, it's not operating even right now the way that it needs to. Um, so there's some concern around that, I think, from staff's perspective. Um, but th at the end of the day, that is something that, you know, we, we can look into. Um, so, you know, and in terms of, um, you know, how we could contribute or how we might be able to access that capital growth fund uh, to help, whether it's something in independent so that it doesn't put that additional strain or whether it somehow does have a, a hookup to, then, you know, we... We need to look at investigating that. We had agreed to do that through policy. Um, we're going to accelerate that to the, you know, to the top of the list. Um, we've we've talked about that, um, but you know, for right now, I think we need to do a little bit more investigation into what the system could potentially handle from, in terms of that kind of a block of that many units, right? Being able to draw on it. So I don't know, Troy. Could I like maybe ask you to comment on that about how we might go about that, or if if you've looked into that, yeah. Sure, I'd, uh, thank you uh, for coming in. Uh, I, again, we have a couple hurdles to cross as well, uh, where uh, when we go into capital, it's usually it's um, restricted to items on our capital plan as well, so that's another hurdle we have to cross as well. Uh, but the policy, uh, Again, we talk, We just had policy before committee of the whole tonight, and I asked council if we could rearrange things so that we could look at sale of municipal land and working with developers. There was a policy that used to exist here uh, that got rescinded years ago to see if that can look be looked at again, because right now um, uh, we don't have that policy. But doesn't mean we can't make one, and council can't make decisions to help and assist. We we saw that last year when the other money came available for this one as well. But this one was on our capital plan as well, right? So, um, I, I think we would just want to uh, take it back, uh, let staff look at all the options we have, and come back to council. And uh, I don't know if we could do it for the Jan the December meeting, but certainly we could for January meeting. Well, yeah. Thanks, Troy. Maybe just to keep the pace 
moving if we could do an update oh, in December okay. um, so that we have some kind of information before we go into the break even if it's just in terms of what we think a timeline might be I, I mean there you know I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I think I you know I'm, I'm seeing some nodding heads around the table we're very interested in supporting this type of a project we just need to make sure that we don't um, break something while we're trying to do that right so so um, yeah so if we could kind of maybe get a quick little check in on it in December so we'll make sure that it comes up on the on the agenda councillor yeah I mean I guess I just wanted to make a comment because I think Rochelle like in your presentation you had just made a comment that we had you talked with us about it in November in terms of what we could do with like w within our bylaws so I did do a little bit of research and I know that we did discuss it in early 2021 I think it was like February or something and we did have like a pretty robust conversation from what I recall I'd, I'd have to dig out my notes but but I think the concern at that time was 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 not about is it important to to um, support projects like yours but the bigger picture which involves a can systems manage it but also be the precedent setting and like where that could where we could find ourselves rolling so you know today you're coming to us with one project with a certain potential budget we have these funds that potentially could be you know what I mean but what do we do when it's two years later and we don't have those pots of funds or we don't have the ability like it, it's a murky place that we need to work through a little bit better and I think again correct me if I'm wrong uh, others at the table but I think at that time we just felt like it was a bigger fish than we could fry financially and and I think that's where it ended up sitting if I recall I, I, again it's been a, like you said it's been almost three years but yeah. I did like I when I had read your briefing note for your presentation I was like I'm pretty sure we talked about that and like I said I did do some research and did see that in in early in in December we discussed it and then in February we discussed it again so so don't, don't think that when you left we just said eh we're good you know we, we knew we we did we did certainly take the conversation seriously I just yeah and I will say too since then because I mean we were really concerned about fiscal you know a capacity and and systems capacity but there are some new funds available now that didn't exist then which may make it more possible for us to participate so um, so we'll re-examine it for with that lens and and considering councillor or at uh, the deputy warden's recommendation there too okay yeah no just um, uh, again you know I think an apology is probably uh, because you're right when, when you look back uh, and Councillor Sampson you are right as well but when you look back we kind of dropped the ball from three years ago to now because it seemed to have slipped the slope and then um, I, again funding funding might have been hard or difficult but it seems like we didn't reach out to to you or to continue to grasp the funding so I think we do have to move it to the to the definitely to the top of the list and uh, Again, great on you for continuing the last two years to move forward. And um, yeah, I think it's one of those things that we, we do have to jump on any funding available. Um, one question I do have, you indicated 150 to 200,000 to build your own. So I presume that's if you take the bull by the horns kind of deal, dig it up, put in the pipes and, okay. Right, so I don't know how that process works through No. Uh, sorry, I assume that you were going to ask process through here, maybe? Yeah. So we have been working with Chris a little bit and on the process of having to submit an application of the system that we are going to build. We have to submit plans and, and do all those development ideas, submit it for approval so that Chris can approve to make sure that it fits the bill yeah. and would run. A um, couple of side notes. One, um, we've continued to work on this for multiple reasons, but you know, a really high one being that we are seeing, you know, older generations of people having to leave their homes and move to places where they no longer have their fi like their family yeah. their culture their f they can't speak french like it's yeah. you know so it comes from a place of like not just developing for you know money in the long term but like it comes from a place of i i want to live here i want to love living here and i want the people who i love to live here so it, it really comes from there <clears throat> um and from a development standpoint, we would have probably developed a significant more amount of units if it wasn't such a hard process. Mm -hmm. Every time you go to try to do something, it feels like you hit a wall and you got to go talk to somebody else and you hit another wall and you got to make an agreement with somebody else. So um, it's definitely frustrating and I can understand why there's not a lot of developers. Mm -hmm. 
but this is what we do and we've done it and we continue to do it because we know that there's a bigger benefit at the other side. And so that's really where we're coming from. Okay, thanks, Rochelle. I think we'll have to leave it there um, and we'll you know, definitely commit to checking back in with you and we'll do a little update maybe at each meeting to try to make sure that we keep some pace on the progress of this, okay? Yeah, the, the main point is just we just need to know if you're in or you're out because just, we just don't want to keep doing the things that we're doing if we can't afford it. So we just kind of need to know where that contribution lies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, next item on the agenda uh, is new business. And Sorry, I thought I pressed my button. Next item on the agenda is new business, and we're ready, I think, at this point to do some presentations to uh, Richmond County Food Banks. Um, so I guess we'll get started, and I'll ask the councillors to participate, I think. 100% yeah. we'll And you're going to take some pictures. Some so we'll just ask for the pay, your patience uh, for folks watching at home, and we're going to do a few presentations. Um, so we'll start with the Alma Dam Food Bank, and maybe I'll ask Councillor Digden and uh, Deputy Warden to come up and help me with that presentation, if that's okay. And whoever your representative is, if you wanted to come up here, and we'll take a nice... We'll take a nice picture at the flags. <laughs> All right. There you go. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much on behalf of the Amadam Food Bank. Absolutely. This, uh, this is really needed. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. It's our pleasure. Okay, so the next group is the St. Peter's. St. Peter's Area Food Bank would be next. Sue is here. Come on down. <laughs> so thank you so much for all the work you do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Got it, Greg. <laughs> I'll throw on our Facebook page. Thank you, guys. This is very much appreciated. You're welcome. We get what we do with money like that is we buy things that we don't normally pack in the bags every week, like like um, uh, toiletries and and now we've been buying like dish soap for them. Like there's so many expensive things for them, but, yeah. but money really helps us do that. So yeah. anyway, thank All you. All right, you're Thanks. welcome. Thank you. All right, so the next is the Lewisdale and Area Food Bank Society. Do we have someone from Lewisdale here? I'll deliver. You will deliver? Okay. Councilor, or Councilor Melanie Sampson will deliver on their behalf. And next is the Holy Guardian Angels Parish. And you'll deliver that? Okay. Thank you. And one for Budladek Food Bank. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. All right. So thanks a lot to the folks um, in the gallery for coming in to receive those checks. And for folks who weren't able to be here, your councillors will deliver that those funds to you uh, in time for, for Christmas. So, and thanks again to all of the food bank volunteers who are helping to make sure that people don't go hungry during the holidays, but also all year round. We appreciate your work. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda then is the extended producer responsibility for packaging paper products and packaging like products regulations. So that's a far cry from food banks, but <laughs> it's a little more, a little more technical in nature. Um, but I did want to uh, bring this forward um, because we're looking at um, needing to make a motion. So this has been a uh, essentially a, a provincial, um, prov province-wide initiative, uh, is what I would say. I know that the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities has worked uh, really hard on uh, getting some EPR regulations in place. Um, and so we're transitioning to a new industry-led program that's expected to take a couple of years. Um, the first phase of the transition requires that we register if we choose to participate and provide data on our curbside recycling program. And the deadline to do that is January 1st, 2024. So thus we're bringing it forward now. And of course, uh, you know, and just for f folks maybe at, at home, um, this is really related to the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. It lays out a series of goals to transition the province to a healthier, more sustainable future. 
And in August of this year, the province released two EPR regulations for packaging paper products, uh, one of the goals which was included in the Act. And uh, so Divert Nova Scotia is administering that program. So I'm assuming that's who we would be registering with. Is defer to Crisp, I think it is yeah. Divert, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so this is our opportunity to opt in, um, and the recycling programs currently operated by municipalities will be assumed by an organization that will act on behalf of the various packaging producers, and details will continue to be provided as all parties work through the process. So um, essentially the shift in responsibility for recycling to producers is estimated by the province to save Nova Scotia municipalities 20 to $25 million annually, collectively. Um, but the direct savings to our municipality specifically is not really known at this time. Um, so staff is recommending that we register for the new industry-led EPR for PPP program. It's a lot of ABCs, DEFGs, but um, but certainly seems to align with our you know our goals around being more sustainable, saving costs and. Uh, costs landing appropriately where they should. So does anybody have any questions or if staff had any additional comments they wanted to make on this? No questions? Okay, so then I'd be looking uh, for a motion to support the recommendation from staff that the municipality register for the new industry-led EPR for PPP program. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Could I have a seconder? I'll second that motion. Thanks, Councillor Brent Sampson. Is there any further discussion? I'm not going to say the motion again because there's a lot of letters. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. So thanks a lot, uh, Troy. And I know, Chris, uh, you've worked on this as well. So um, really appreciate your work on that. OK, um, so the next item on the agenda is the Warden's Council Report. So I did provide that in advance. Thank you for the nudge on that, Shelley. Sometimes I get it done like a week beforehand and then forget to send it in. So I appreciate the reminder. Um, but are there any questions about the activities noted on that list? Okay, so hearing none. Um, it was a quiet month. <laughs> it was a quiet month, yeah. Not so much. <laughs> um, I did want to just mention that on it, though, the, there I did mention a letter of support for the physician, for a physician to be located at the Dr. Kingston Memorial Health, Community Health Center. Um, and, you know, essentially this is a physician that was looking to locate in the area. Um, but... Uh, you know, sometimes they don't get to select where they're going to be located because if they're involved in the uh, practice ready assessment program, the PrEP program we call it. So um, what we've done is kind of assumed a little bit of a community campaign to encourage that, you know, the powers that be to allow that physician to locate here. Um, and certainly I took the opportunity to outline what it would mean for the health center as well. I don't, and um, counselors would have a copy of that. So, um, Hopefully we'll get a, a good result on that. Um, okay, if there's no other questions on the uh, council report, then we'll move on. Um, the next item on the agenda is our CEO is administration operations report. So thank you, Troy and staff. I know everybody contributes greatly to this. Um, and I, you know, I'm certainly finding it very helpful. Um, I did want to ask, there was one question I had about... Um, I think it was on the recreation side. Um, community Department of Community Development and Recreation, a couple of bullets down, there's a mention of an online interactive map being completed by EDPC and that it's completed but some cosmetic upgrades are happening. Is that for the municipal planning strategy? Uh, it, I can't think what else it was. Just, I would have sorry. to check. And of course the one director that's not here, she okay. had a previous commitment <laughs> and she couldn't make it tonight but I'll have to check with Shannon and get back to you. Okay, thanks. Troy, that would be great if, if you could do that because I am still getting some questions from members of the public about the potential impact in the rural general zone in particular. So um, I think a map, I found the, the map, the interactive map really helpful um, when members of the public were asking questions because you could you could click right in on their address and figure out what, you know, what the zoning uh, restrictions would be. But then of course they took it down because it was a map based, you know, it was a map designed to accept feedback and comment, and that period is over, so they had to kind of make some adjustments there. Right. So I'm hoping that that's what that is. So thank you for following up on that. That would be great. Um, are there any other questions on the admin report?
Okay. So hearing none, I will move us on to the next item on the agenda. Please don't take the silence for a lack of interest. This is super helpful, <laughs> really helpful. <laughs> All right, so the next item on the agenda is the um, community acknowledgements. And we generally start this off with an acknowledgement of our volunteer of the month. Uh, so this year's, or this month's, past, past month's volunteer of the month was Charlene Bonin who I believe is from the Deputy Warden's District. Okay, so I'm just gonna read a little bit of her Volunteer of the Month nomination. It notes that Charlene stands as a pillar of compassion and community spirit in Richmond County. Her commitment to community service goes above and beyond to extend a helping hand to those in need. It's not uncommon to spot her offering rides to community members or running errands for community members on her way home from work. She sounds like a great neighbor. <laughs> so Charlene's dedication to volunteerism spans many years. She, uh, her active involvement with three local boards speaks volumes about her commitment uh, to the betterment of the community. She serves on the Angel Fund, the New Horizons Senior Club, and the St. Anne's Auxiliary. She lends her time, expertise, and passion to various causes, making a positive impact on the lives of those who she serves. Beyond her board commitments, Charlene extends her volunteering efforts to Lepi Cass, where she's an integral part of the community hub. Whether she's working behind the bar, waiting tables with a smile, or contributing her creative touch to event decorations, her versatility shines through. So please join us in recognizing Charlene for her hard work, dedication, and commitment to her community. If, uh, for members of the public who know Charlene, give her a pat on the back, give her a round of applause, uh, because she, certainly people like Charlene keep our communities running and keep them as wonderful places to live. So we thank you very much, Charlene. Did you want to say anything else, Deputy Warden? Or well, I will, I guess you just press your button. <laughs> Councilor Melanie is smiling over there, so she knows I got some community acknowledgements. Uh, so, yeah, so I just want to congratulate and acknowledge uh, Charlene. That's, uh, you know, and for everything she does uh, for our community and, and here on Amadam, so and in Richmond County. So congratulations to her. Also want to uh, congratulate uh, Richie Thibault. Uh, Richie is a uh, resident or a former resident that grew up here in uh, Bougerville, here on Amadam. Uh, he's the son of Otwin and uh, Zita Thibault from Erichat. And uh, Richie, uh, as the director of hockey operations, which is also the general, general manager role, uh, led uh, the U-17 Team Canada White uh, to a gold medal at the World U-17 Hockey Challenge in Charlottetown. So uh, when it comes to Richie, uh, he's had a long uh, career in, in the hockey world. Uh, he was a, a amateur scout for uh, the NHL's Calgary Flames for 12 years or so. And then he became uh, a head scout for the uh, St. John Sea Dogs in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And uh, he is now uh, in his hometown of Moncton. Uh, uh, he started with the Moncton Wildcats in 2017-18 as a scout as well, uh, but has assumed the role of uh, general manager, and he's been in that role since uh, 2020. So just want to congratulate Richie on all his uh, hockey, hockey accomplishments. Uh, everybody here on Almadam, Richie, and here in Pitagra, your family and your friends are very proud of your accomplishments. and. Uh, and uh, bravo, my, bravo, my friend. So, uh, felicitation, Richie. Uh, to the more ici, little madame, you obtained a great, a très fier de toi. Puis, uh, bravo, uh, mon ami. Also, uh, one more, if I may. Two more, two more. Sorry. Uh -oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I had the privilege to uh, attend the five-year anniversary for the uh, Hearts of Amadam Society uh, last weekend. And uh, when looking at that group, you know, as I said during that event, uh, when you look at the, the first five years of, of, of that Hearts Home, it's called, uh, they've provided their clients with, you know, a sense of security and a, a sense of independence and, and joy, hope, uh, security, uh, stability, routine, you know. And they've also provided them with a sense of belonging and a sense of family. And uh, it's great, you know, and, and for me, the most important thing is that they've provided them a home. And then when you look at, you know, to me, the quote that sticks out the most, and I told them this last weekend, uh, you know, a quote that, that 
stands out for all of those volunteers in, in that group uh, states that a happy home has a foundation of love and a framework of support and all of those people uh, associated with that great society is the foundation and the framework that provides the love and support to all their clients right so just want to acknowledge them and, and thank them and uh, you know, congratulate them on their five year anniversary and the last one <laughs> has to do with the Hearts of Madame Society as well uh, I want to thank uh, the Director of Public Works and the staff here. Uh, I did notice the 13 beautiful wreaths. Uh, again, Chris, I probably were about 14 or 15, not 13, but <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I want to I want to acknowledge uh, your 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 crew, uh, Chris, for putting those up. Uh, they're all on the 13 poles here on our Main Street in Arishad, So thanks very much. I appreciate that. Okay, thanks, Deputy Warden. <laughs> See, unlucky 13 was avoided. Two were purchased to here in the building as well. So, All right, are there any other community acknowledgements? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, I I always hate following Sean. He's he, he's he's so passionate. It's lovely. Uh, I ha I have uh, uh, two acknowledgments. Um, one to the uh, St. Louis CWL who held their annual Christmas bazaar, uh, and they always have great events there uh, on Sunday. I couldn't attend. I was had a special pickup at the airport, but um, all accounts were that it was a really wonderful event with great. Um, what a great market and always a great meal and uh, a great merchandise bingo. So congratulations to them for that. Um, and I'd also like to congratulate the local ATV clubs in my district, the West Richmond Riders Association and the Bearishwa Trail Association. They've been doing a lot of work on their respective trails over the past number of uh, months. Um, and I had a chance to go out uh, recently and they're just looking spectacular so both between like infrastructure work but also in some of the nice things uh, like installing garbage cans and picnic tables along the route to make things even more comfortable I think for for you know walkers bicyclers ATVers w whatever so um, and just always awesome to see people out on those trails nice to see them being developed so congratulations and thanks to all the volunteers and all of those groups for the great things they're doing to make the district Awesome. Great. Thank you, Councillor Sampson. Are there any other folks who would like to chime in? Um, I'll just make one quick mention of uh, in St. Peter's recently we did the tree lighting. I think it was last weekend. Um, and it, was, it went really well. Again, another community effort where everyone pitches in. So thanks to the folks who are making that happen. And I know that there are tree lightings and Christmas events coming up throughout just about every community in Richmond County this year. Um, so hope folks can get a chance to take advantage of those and come out and see them. I'm looking forward to that Christmas parade on Saturday night in Lordways. Let me tell you, it's always a doozy. So, um, so we're, we're looking forward to that. So thanks, folks, uh, for your work on that. All right, so if there's nothing else, I'll move us on. Okay, um, so the next item on the agenda is correspondence, um, and we do have some that are action required. The first is a, a memo from the CFO Jason Martell regarding a grant request from the Alma Dam Food Bank uh, for the Type 4 Regional Health General Grant funds in the amount of one to two thousand dollars. So, sorry, Warden, I've taken over the mic, but I do have to declare conflict because I'm the person who prepared the financials that you're going to look at. <laughs> okay, thank you, Councillor Sampson. Um, so, uh, so just moving on to the memo then, uh, Councillor Sampson has de declared her conflict. The group has indicated that they're requesting uh, at least 1000 and could spend up to 2000 if approved. But then they stated that although they have quite a bit of funds in their bank account, those funds are mainly restricted for food purchases and they don't have funds to purchase the equipment they're looking for in their application. So this is really more about the equipment than it is about the annual contribution that we do um, for food to the food banks. Um, and maybe I'll ask one of, you know, either counsel from Alma Dam, I don't know if you had any comments on this, but I'd open it for discussion at this point. I thought Councillor Sampson might have been pushing his button again to uh, change the color of his. Um, I think the only comment I would make, Madam Warden, is that our, uh, our fund is getting, I guess, um, slow, is getting low. Um, but we still have money in our district funds. So I, I think uh, at this time I would be willing to
probably meet somewhere in the middle at the $1,500 mark and take uh, possibly 750 out of my district fund. And um, I can't speak for Councillor Sampson, but I'm going to throw it over to him so that he's put on the hot plate. And uh, <laughs> Okay, thanks, Councillor Digden. So you're proposing that you would put forward $750 from your district to funds. Okay. Councillor, yeah? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think uh, I think we're in agreement uh, with that, Councillor Digden. Uh, that's the direction I was going to take as well, uh, knowing that our our regional fund is uh, dwindling and um, we have uh, several months to go. Uh, yeah, I'd be willing to uh, go 750 as well from my district fund and uh, get them to uh, $1,500 mark. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Deputy Warden. So I think uh, I'm hearing a motion frame up that um, we would approve a $1,500 contribution to the Almadiam uh, Food Bank uh, in the amount of $1,500 uh, with, uh, with $750 uh, to be allocated as follows, $750 from District 1 funds and $750 from District 2 funds. Right? Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Digden. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Deputy Warden. So the motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Sampson? No? Okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. Thanks, folks. You can come on back in, Councillor Melanie. All right. Okay, thank you. So the next item, and thanks to, to Jason, of course, for preparing that uh, application. I know you work with the groups who are, who are getting ready to do so, and, um, and we appreciate that effort. So um, the next items on the agenda are several um, letters of support, but before that, there's the International Day for Persons with Disabilities Proclamation. So um, I missed it by a day because I couldn't get my video to upload, but um, I did want to mention uh, for members of the public that councillors had agreed because we were uh, creeping up, our, our meeting was scheduled for the day after uh, December 3rd, which is International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Um, councillors agreed by email that uh, we could go ahead with a proclamation. Um, so that has been issued out on uh, our social media, I believe, uh, at this point. Um, uh, yeah, I had took downtown Ottawa connectivity to get it to upload for me, but we got it done um, and certainly want to express uh, our appreciation for, um, you know, folks uh, living with uh, d disabilities in our community and especially to the folks who are helping us uh, be a more accessible community, uh, particularly those on our accessibility committee. So um, any f discussion on that item? Additional letters that were provided were the two letters of support, one for the physician, as I mentioned earlier, for the Dr. Kingston Memorial Health Center, and one to Minister Lohr regarding the Wastewater Management District project. So, Okay, the next item on the agenda is the review of checks issued for November 2023, and that's been issued, uh, provided for information. Does anybody have any questions for staff on that? Okay, so hearing none, I'm going to move us on to the next item. It's the review of action items. So I was happy to be able to check a few things off of that list uh, in the last couple of weeks um, in terms of the letters and communications. So um, any questions on those? All right, if there's uh, no questions, we'll proceed on to the items added to the agenda. And the first item added is the Marine Renewables Canada Conference for 2023. So. Um, councillors, I've provided a briefing note and I'll ensure that um, I've emailed this to Shelley as well so she can make it formally a part of the package. Again, the not so brief briefing note, I apologize, um, but these conferences are, they're jam packed with learning and information and I always feel it's wise to capture it so that we don't lose the the thread of, uh, you know, of what we're learning as we go along. Um, I won't go through the whole note. But I will just mention that uh, this year's conference was located in Ottawa. The last number of years it's been in Halifax. But that was a purposeful, I think, and a very strategic move for MRC because they are advocating for the passing of Bill C-49, which is the amendments to the Accord Acts, which will enable regulatory pathways for offshore renewables developments and expanding the authority specifically of the Canada-Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board to act as the regulator for those renewables. 
The presentations at the conference included content related to the development of supply chains, permitting grid capacity, sustainability finance, resource assessment, and more. Nova Scotia, and specifically the energy projects here in the Strait area, um, Bearhead, Everwind, DP Energy, were on, uh, frankly, they were the spotlight of the entire conference. Um, there was a huge light shining on Nova Scotia and shining on the Strait, ear, uh, Strait area. Um, and uh, just also wanted to mention that Agear Insights, uh, they facilitate a panel with those parties in, that I just mentioned involved, and they continue to be a key source of research capacity for the province. And of course, Agear is a company that was founded by um, uh, Scott Urquhart, who was originally from Dundee, but has um, you know made a career in the in the uh, renewable sector, marine renewable sector in Denmark. Um, so, you know, we were invited to participate in that conference as we are every year um, and was certainly uh, glad to be able to go. I did note uh, some of the key takeaways. Uh, you'll note in, in the update that a lot of the activity was meeting with members of parliament. So, um, you know, a, a few that, that we would have had some contact with were Deputy Speaker Chris Dontrema, um some very familiar names to the folks here in Alma Dam, MP Daryl Sampson, uh, uh, former MLA Michelle Sampson, and former MP Roger Cousner, among others in attendance. Um, and we made specific um, efforts to have conversations with those folks to talk about that enabling legislation and to, to see if there was anything we could do as a, as a, a, a I guess, a, a community to, to help um, get that bill passed. Um, there is some opposition uh, f from, you know, from the opposition side of government right now, but we're hoping that, you know, by communicating with them about the importance of it for Atlantic Canada and, frankly, for all of Canada, this is a nation-building opportunity. Um, historic investments have already happened and are, conti and are continuing to happen. Um, and, and, of course, also we continue to have our focus on... Um, our, you know, our messaging to uh, to you know representatives is that we need it. We need to be you know the marine spatial planning work that's that needs to happen. The renewable um, you know discussions that need to happen in our communities have to make sure that the rep that the interests of fishers and other ocean users are represented in and considered um, in in those discussions going forward. So so that's been a key feature of our messaging um, and certainly I think one that has been received very well. Um, just wanted to mention from the key takeaways, um, a few a few pieces I wanted to highlight was a lot of there was a lot of talk around domestic market development, which I know has been a concern for some folks for the hydrogen projects that are proposed, um, because they are primarily export development. But there was really a lot of talk at the conference and by developers around how do we increase the domestic market to make sure that maybe our bus fleets can be green and our you know. Um, you know, you know they're working on you know heavy haul trucking that kind of thing along you know, so um, so there's some real work going on around that, um, and as well paths to market, um, and and both and global insights are pointing to regulatory certainty. So I you know at the end of the day our message really has been let's get this enabling legislation passed so that community communities can focus on what's important and that's supporting. Uh, not just developers, but supporting our communities to make sure that those developments are right for our communities, right? Um, and that, that involves a lot of community engagement. So there are some offshore wind um, sessions that are going on right now across, the, uh, across Cape Breton Island. So I just want to bring that to the public's attention. I think the ones in Richmond County are on Monday. And I've asked uh, the Cape Breton Partnership to provide us with a little graphic that we can share out on social media. I believe it's landed on Telil. We're going to make sure that the word's getting out about that. Um, those sessions are being hosted by the Cape Breton Partnership and Net Zero Atlantic. So it's not a particular developer. Um, it's, so it's, there's not like that industry angle. It's very much information-based, a place where people can come and ask uh, questions and, um, and get more information about uh, about what you know, what offshore wind is all about, and what it could mean for the community, and what we need to consider when we're when we're talking about implementing something like that, because it's it will have big impacts. So, um, so we'll maybe share that information out. Sure. I think I talked long enough about that. There's a little light reading in your packages. <laughs> we'll make sure that that's available <laughs> to everyone. And uh, okay, thanks for indulging me on that item. Um, I think count does anyone have any questions before I move on? Okay. Traveling in the winter, 
not the best, <laughs> not the best use of my time. <laughs> anyway, that's it is what it is, right? Um, okay. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is uh, 911 protocols. So I think Councillor Digden, you wanted to mention something about that. I did. Thank you, Madam Warden, and uh, thank you for the extra reading that you provided us. <laughs> it's greatly appreciated. Um, so I had a I had a call this week from a resident uh, in the community. Um, what a major concern, and I just wanted to, to brief everybody on the concern, and I, I think it brings back to something that myself and Councillor Sampson talked about when it comes to the, the magnets on the fridge or letting first responders know if you have, a, you know, an issue or a problem or, you know, a health issue. But just to brief everybody, the, um, the, the lady in question had taken a seizure and was on the phone Somebody was on the phone with 911 for approximately 10 minutes, um, but then 911 um, had to let them go because they had another call. So um, before any ambulance or first responders or anybody showed up, 911 um, disconnected the call. So again, it kind of left the person in distraught that was taking care of the person with the seizure. Um, and then two weeks ago, two weeks after um, the same person had a similar episode. Um, 911 stayed on the phone for several minutes <clears throat> um, with an ETA from the ambulance this time, but in the meantime, the local resident reached out to the volunteer fire department who responded. So I, I don't know, it's kind of just a, a briefing, you know, maybe for awareness that people might want to put a second number or a second contact or. Somebody, some, somebody who they can reach out to. In the, I know the Almaden Volunteer Fire Department has stepped away from medical first response because of the numbers that they still respond if required or if asked for assistance. But otherwise, if it goes out to the call out 911, if it's an ambulance call out, then they're not tagged in that call anymore. So it's just kind of an awareness to the people that, yeah. I don't know. I know the resident reached out to our MLA for a little bit of, you know, with concern that after 10 minutes they were disconnected. And I understand, like, everybody, 911 is probably shorthanded as well, but. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks, Councillor Digden. I know there are certainly uh, lots of tr struggles still within our health care system, and, and I'm glad to hear that she reached out to the MLA. Um, I think those, you know, that those types of information are things we need to share so that they're aware of some of the gaps that are happening in the system. And really, thanks to the your, your volunteer fire department for uh, for helping out with that. So, okay, any questions for Councillor Dignan on that item? Okay, so hearing none, uh, I'm going to move us on to the 15-minute question period. Uh, so the number to call is 902-226-9885. So if you're watching at home, you can call in, and we will uh, take your question by phone. And when you do call in, we'll uh, ask you to state your name uh, and let us know where you're calling from, and um, and we can take your question that way. But if there are members of the public who would, or members in the gallery right now, if you'd like to ask a question, you're welcome to come to the table and and uh, ask away. <laughs> so I have a question. Oh, I'm Claire, I'm Claire Doyle. I'm with the Seniors Take Action Coalition. And I have a question, but I'd like to do a little background before asking the question. Well, it's question period, Claire, so I'll ask you to keep your question real I'll short. keep it very quick. Okay. I'll be very quick. <laughs> So in June 2023, the, the HRM Council approved the Voluntary Vulnerable Persons Registry. Uh, this is a voluntary self-referral list for residents who require more support during emergency situations. It also provides important information to first responders and emergency management staff and volunteers to help appropriately respond to residents' needs in situations such as sustained power outages, uh, severe storms, and more. This is an issue that has been a concern for the Seniors Take Action Coalition for some time now. Knowing that we have many seniors that live alone in rural areas. The question is, uh, has Richmond County considered 
the possibility of a voluntary uh, vulnerable persons registry as part of its emergency response. Uh, is it possible that the emergency management officer can work with STAT, which is the Senior uh, Take Action Coalition, to explore this option uh, of moving ahead with the registry? So that was my question. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, and that's a great question. And I 100% agree that it needs to happen, um, that we do need a vulnerable person's registry of some sort. Um, I can tell you that at the latest Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities conference, it came up as a question to um, Minister Lohr uh, for municipal, housing, uh, municipal Affairs and Housing um, because, you know, there are many folks within the municipalities that feel we could use a provincial standardized registry, right, so that each municipality is not reinventing the wheel in terms of building a system to house this data and how you collect elected, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, doesn't look like the provincial government is interested in in doing that. Um, they really do feel that it is a municipal responsibility. It is something that we have discussed. We've received correspondence about it and sent correspondence about it um, back and forth with the provincial government. Um, and I believe Troy has indicated to me, and was why we were just having a quick chat while you were asking your question, um, there is a response back from uh, the province and it will be coming back in our next council package um, in a couple of weeks. So. So the answer is yes, we, we are considering, we have discussed it. Um, so, we'll, you know, we just needed to wait for that response back from the province and then we'll, we'll make a decision on how or if we, we move forward. There, there, you know, there would be probably budgetary implications um, and, and some process that we would need to work out uh, in terms of how we would go about even establishing something like that. Um, but um, very glad to know that stack is kind of on the on the case and you know we may call upon you to assist us with figuring that whole thing out when the time comes but I do agree it's a much needed service there's many seniors in our community in particular people with you know mobility challenges that you know they're they're left in the dark and the cold some you know if you know if things go sideways with a major weather event I think about the fires that occurred and you know we were all very nervous last summer um, you know hoping that a spark wouldn't light here and yeah there's a there's it's a gap in our emergency measures and and hopefully that you know I guess hopefully we can find a way to fix it in short order so yeah thank you, thank you. Thank you. all right are there any other questions Okay, so hearing none, and the phone hasn't rang, and I think the question would have definitely accounted for the delay, so um, I, I am going to move us in camera, but before I do that, I have to just circle back on the, com com it's not really a community acknowledgement, but as we close out community committee of the whole uh, tonight, I just want to mention that in the last month or so, we have celebrated long-term service awards. Uh, for staff um, here at the municipality. 11 people were recognized with service awards, I think, of 10, 20, 20 and 25 years. Um, and altogether, those 11 people, they bring about 185 years of service and experience to the municipal operation. So could we just give them a little round of applause? Please and thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, at this point then, I'll ask for a motion to move us in camera for a discussion on uh, land and legal. Um, please and thank you. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Digden. Can I have a seconder? Thanks very much, uh, uh, Councillor Sampson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried.